Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everyone, to the symposium, uh, which is entitled Towards a Holistic Understanding of the Pandemic, Advances in COVID-19 Research. The symposium was organized as a way to showcase the diversity of scholarship that's being done um, here in the Sue and Bill Gross School of Nursing by our faculty. I am Miriam Bender. I'm an associate professor here in the school, and I'm also the associate dean for academic and student affairs. Uh, the idea for the symposium, uh, I do not claim credit for, it came from two of our faculty, um, Associate Professor Sun Hyuk Shin, soon to be Associate Professor, and um, Associate Professor Dr. Nakia Best. I also just wanted to say that while a lot of our research is being presented today, um, it still um, represents only a sample of, of all the COVID-19 research efforts here in the school. So for example, um, Dr. Bass could not present today, but she is working with um, her campus partners at the School of Medicine and community partners from the School Nurses of California Foundation uh, to examine the impact of COVID-19 on school nurses and school health services. So this is still only a, a sample of everything that we're doing. We hope you'll join us for all the presentations today, but we understand if you're coming in to just view specific panels. Um, just to let you know a little bit about the organization of the symposium, uh, we do have 10 panels um, scheduled, which are broken up into two sections, and we'll have a small break in the middle of them at 3.10. Uh, for each panel, there will be a 20 minute presentation followed by five minutes of Q&A, uh, for which, um, um, Dr. Sun Hyuk Shin and I will both co-moderate. Uh, you can put your questions to the panelists at any time, please into the Q&A box. Um, please don't use the chat box for your question. You can use that for chatting. And um, we will read them out to the panelists in the order that they've been received. And uh, we will continue with Q&A until it is time to stop and um, begin the next panel presentation. Um, you see our lovely Kate Thompson here. She is our um, instructional designer at the school. And she's going to be helping out throughout producing the event, helping to bring speakers into the panels, um, having people leave, et cetera. Um, as this is the first time we are uh, doing a symposium uh, via Zoom, we hope that uh, you will be patient with us uh, if there are any glitches that occur. Okay, so to get started, I would like to introduce our first panelist, uh, Dr. Jungin Park. Uh, Jungin Park is an assistant professor here at the School of, School of Nursing. And her research is focused on biomedical informatics using predictive modeling and machine learning techniques. Um, and today, right now, she's going to present her interdisciplinary teamwork to develop and va validate a prognostic tool for COVID-19 critical disease. Dr. Park, thank you so much for joining us. And I am very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, today, I'll be presenting uh, my work with my interdisciplinary team to develop and validate a prognostic tool for COVID-19 critical disease. So. Next slide, please. Yep. So um, this is this was truly really a um, team effort uh, from radiological department, uh, computer science, nursing, uh, infectious disease department, and also um, radiological department Emory. So this was done. Uh, this project was done in two different institutions to achieve the um, high validity. Next slide, please. So uh, let me introduce a little bit um, about um, the research. Um, it, the research was done last year, uh, last spring, when there was a huge surge in COVID. Um, so at the time, uh, the rapid spread of COVID-19 revealed uh, really significant constraints in critical care capacity. And in anticipation of subsequent waves, accurate and rapid patient um, prog prognostication was essential for critical care utilization management. So uh, reliable 
early identification of patients um, who likely to develop critical disease may uh, facilitate prompt intervention and improve outcomes. Um, at that time, several attempts had been, had been made to develop prognostic models for COVID-19 disease, um, largely based on early data from patient cohorts in China. Um, but um, these initial models were of variable quality with a high, high likelihood of biases and limited numbers of variables and performance evaluation was limited by um, suboptimal reporting and limited validation. Next slide, please. So really we felt the need uh, to develop uh, a new um, uh, prognostic tool that's uh, validated outside of one institution. So the purpose of this study was to develop and externally validate a prognostic model and clinical tool for uh, predicting COVID-19 critical disease at presentation to a medical center. Next slide, please. This is how we did it. After approval of um, the IRB of the UCI Medical Center, uh, we developed a prognostic model uh, using the data from a single center retrospective observation or cohort of patients at UCI who were um, diagnosed with COVID-19 at the UCI Medical Center. Um, the data was from March 1st to April 31 in 2020. It was two um, month period. And then the model was validated with a separate retrospective observational cohort of patients with COVID-19 disease at Emory Healthcare in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, patients in the validation cohort were randomly selected from um, the patients who were diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, data were obtained from the electronic health records and clinical and laboratory values were obtained from um, the earliest documented results at the time of presentation. Um, but if a specific laboratory value was not um, initially available, then the value occurring time closest um, after presentation was used. Um, the primary outcome was the likelihood of critical disease where uh, critical disease was defined as ICU admission, ventilation, or death. Uh, the initial index date for uh, each patient was the date of COVID-19 diagnosis, and all patients had, had follow-up of outcomes for, for a minimum of 10 days. Um, so the derivation cohort at UCI was used to develop a multivariable logistic regression model and the model performance was assessed on the validation cohort um, at Emory Healthcare. Next slide, please. But before we um, develop the predictive model, we search for the literature for predict predictors of COVID-19 disease, severity, and then um, identified several candidate predictors. Um, this include demographic characteristics, presenting viral signs, past medical history, and um, presenting laboratory values. Next slide, please. And then among those uh, candidate predictors, we uh, did feature selection um, using recursive feature selection technique. Um, re univariate statistical testing was applied to the cohort to, to identify the variables with greatest differences in distribution. Um, and we started with the variable calculated to have the largest differences. And additional variables were added to the model uh, one by one in order of significance based on univariate testing until the model uh, performance plateaus. And based on these results and uh, prevalence of candidate predictors, um, the top 13 covariates were chosen and used to create multivariable logistic regression model. For, for missing data, uh, median imputation was performed based on underlying critical disease status. Each covariate was independently normalized to a scale of one, zero to one based on minimum and maximum values uh, present in the data set. Um, 
the model was um, the patients missing more than 50% of the data were excluded from analysis. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, the predictive accuracy of the model was determined retrospectively in the external validation cohort with discrimination and collaboration. Uh, for any given patient, missing data was imputed using population-derived median values from the training cohort. Um, and additionally, all model inputs were clipped to the minimum and maximum values present in the training cohort. Uh, model discrimination, which is the degree to which uh, the model differences between um, individuals with critical and non-critical outcomes, was uh, calculated with a C statistic. And all analysis were conducted using the Python cycling library and IBM SPSS statistics. And then we developed a clinical tool, a web-based application, uh, was created in Python using a Flask server, which is like a web framework, to, to facilitate clinical implementation of the trained model. Next slide, please. Yep. Next slide, please. So here are the results uh, for, for the der derivation cohort at UCI. A total of 3,208 COVID-19 tests were conducted over the study period, like two months. Um, avoid, and among them, we had nine, about 9% were positive. And um, among those 9% of the patient, um, clinical data, including past medical history and presenting laboratory values were available for, for about 29% of the patients. So we ended up having 87 patients with the, all the EHR data. Uh, and for the uh, validation cohort of, of the 40 patients, uh, oh, I, I forgot to um, add the characteristics of the derivation cohort. So for the derivation cohort at UCI, uh, critical disease was presented uh, in 24, 24%. And among them, most common comorbidities included obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. Uh, whereas in uh, validation cohort at Emory, um, critical disease was present in 65%, it was pretty high. Um, but the common comorbidities were uh, the same, obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. Um, characteristics between these two cohorts were, were notable for increased prevalence of comorbidities in the validation cohort. So that was uh, the big difference we had. Next slide, please. So after future selection, uh, we selected the following factors uh, that are associated with greatest increased risk of critical disease, which include, and those were, include, those were used in model training, uh, age, gender, total number of comorbidities, um, like VMI, re respiratory rate, white blood cell count, et cetera. So we included those um, factors to the to train the model. Next slide, please. So uh, this, this is the receiver operator curve, which shows the model discrimination. Uh, model discrimination in the derivation cohort was high with the concordance statistic 0.45. Um, it also shows positive predictive value uh, of 73% and negative predictive value was 96.7%. Uh, and also uh, the Dr. model discrimination. Sorry, Dr. Park, sorry to interrupt. I think the slide might not be at the same um, place as, as your, your talk. So can you, can oh. you uh, let Kate know um, where she should advance the slide? It should be slide 14. Kate, can you? Go back to slide 14. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. So um, yeah, I was talking about validation court, right? 
The modal discrimination and the validation cohort was also high uh, with concordant statistic 0.94. Um, and the positive predictive value was 86.7% and negative predictive value was 100%. Please note that we had very small number of um, uh, validation sets. So next slide, please. And this is the result that web that we developed. It's a web-based tool uh, to enable clinicians to input patient data and view uh, model output. So the page accepts user input and outputs the likelihood of critical disease. And it really doesn't require all variables to be present. So it's, uh, it's really practical. Next slide, please. Yeah, so here are some discussions. Um, in this study, we developed an externally validated uh, predictive model um, and a clinical tool that can be used to, to progress to cape the likelihood of COVID-19 disease based on data available early in a patient's presentation. And by using uh, derivation and validation cohorts from you know, separate institutions uh, with different underlying patient characteristics, in particular, a um, higher uh, prevalence of comorbidities in the validation cohort, we um, achieved high calibration and discrimination. Um, also, this model has the potential to be utilized by frontline healthcare providers to, to predict cl uh, critical care demand and provide early indications of the likelihood a patient's condition may worsen. And as therapeutic interventions become uh, validated, this may enable um, early intervention in at-risk patients to improve outcomes. Um, in particular, um, antiviral therapies may have increased efficacy if administered earlier in the disease course. Next slide, please. So compared with other earlier models, which were primarily single institution based, uh, which are developed from patient court, cohorts in, a, in, a, uh, in China, uh, utilized only a few variables. Um, and please note that this study was done in the early phase of COVID last year. So at that time, there were not many um, studies that are validated. Um, compared to those uh, models and studies, this model may have greater relevance and predictive strength in cohorts of Western patients in which obesity is more common. In particular, the inclusion of nearly 30 candidate variables in model derivation ensures um, sufficient consideration to numerous previously identified prognostic relates. Interestingly, uh, previous Interestingly, variables which have previously been reported to be associated with worse COVID-19 disease, uh, such as older age and hypertension, were less predictive in our sample uh, than, than BMI, total number of comorbidities, and several uh, lab balances. So uh, I guess characteristic, patient characteristics are a little different. Next slide, please. The frontline um, healthcare providers have been inundated with critical ill uh, COVID-19 patients. Um, and a simple web-based tool utilized at patient presentation may facilitate decision-making by simplifying, simplifying um, integration of numerous clinical variables. Our model has a high negative predictive value, uh, which uh, can increase physician confidence in determining which patients may be discharged safely at presentation. And this is of particular utility in settings of high healthcare utilization, especially when you know, physicians or, or clinicians are treating um, higher than expected number of patients or working outside of their standard practice. Our model has high positive predictive value highlighting um, those patients for, for whom admission and closed clinical monitoring may be appropriate. Mm. Yes. Um, next slide, please. Um, a limited 
uh, small there, there are some limitations in this study. Um, a limited small sample of patient data was reviewed retrospectively from two centers. And um, please note that it was really early stage uh, of the COVID um, of the pandemic. So uh, the numbers were really limited. Um, also, the data was obtained retrospectively. So there was no uh, control um, over which laboratory data was collected, which varied with institutional practice patterns. However, um, in this study, the model performed well in the validation data set uh, with incomplete laboratory values. Um, so I guess that kind of worked out. Um, also further testing on larger cohorts of patient data is needed. Um, conclusions may not be globally generalizable to different patient cohorts. Um, lastly, not all patients had complete data available. Uh, while uh, imputation is an imperfect approximation to true lab value data, our model showed high performance on an external data set with missing data. And this show, this suggests that the approach was uh, kind of reasonable. So that worked out as well. So as a conclusion, uh, we present a predictive model and clinical tool which can be used to prognosticate the likelihood of COVID-19 critical disease based on data at um, patient presentation. Further testing is re required, is needed on larger patient cohorts to establish generalizability. Next slide, please. Oh, that's the conclusion I just talked about. Yep, so uh, I'm open to any questions uh, if you have any. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Park. It's an amazing presentation and just um, a ton of work that went into that. And, and thank you for, um, for your presentation. So I'll go ahead and start out with a question, but just a reminder to the audience, uh, please feel free to uh, input your questions in the Q&A box. That's to the bottom uh, right of your screen. Um, so the first question that I had was, um, you know, clearly this was a very multidisciplinary work involving numerous parties with numerous um, areas of expertise. And, um, and I think it really highlights the fact that uh, a lot of the research, you know, infectious diseases, chronic diseases, whatever that you're working on really uh, does require uh, these days more, more than ever before, um, you know, multidisciplinary team science approaches. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, kind of, um, how that worked out in um, in practice in terms of and you know the contributions that each each person made and, and uh, especially with yourself and um, your background both as um, you know in nursing as well as in um, informatics and you know how how um, you know in what areas uh, that that you were able to contribute to this team. Thank you for the question. And I think that's really a good question and uh, very timely uh, because as you mentioned, these days, uh, more and more studies are doing interdis going interdisciplinary research and especially in informatics, that's true because health informatics requires expertise in both areas. Well, actually we, we say that there are the three areas that you need to be expertise, uh, healthcare, um, informatics and computer science. So um, that, that was really um, what's about in informatics and um, this research. So uh, we had computer, computer expert, experts um, and um, clinical experts, and uh, we leveraged both expertise in, in, well, for example, when identifying the problem, clinical problem, definitely, you know, clinical expertise uh, play an important role, but as we uh, execute the problem and uh, drive the results, then we definitely need uh, uh, um, computer, computer science experts or informatics experts um, ability. Um, so um, that was the big two, uh, two big wheels that played the, uh, the project. But um, as my role here was to translate those two um, disciplines so translate the language, translate the um, knowledge, so so that they can, so they have different priorities, uh, 
for example, for clinicians, you know, highest accuracy is, is the important because they have to use it in practice. But for, for computer scientists or informaticians, um, usability or, you know, uh, generalizability or, or um, the accuracy or, or the innovative innovation of the approach would, would, would be the priority. So you have to juggle between those two. Um, and um, as experts in both areas, I could uh, play a role to um, kind of juggle those two uh, priorities. So that was the role here, me. Thank you. We have a, we have a question um, from Babak. Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. I wonder if this model considers other symptoms or is it just about the comor comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, and so on? Uh, that's, a, that's a very uh, good question. Yeah, so the short answer is we, we didn't uh, um, add the symptoms at this, at, at this uh, model, in this model, uh, just because we had a limited number of patients and as if we add more features, then we were we were we were to lose more pa more patients in in the cohort. So we kind of limited um, the features that are that we used uh, to expand to 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 maximize the patients we could use in the EHR. So that was the simple reason. And um, in the future, definitely we would like to um, add those uh, symptoms um, as they come in. I'm, I'm wondering if I could ask a follow-up question to that, sure, sure. because that's, you, you mentioned, you know, it's, it's, it's like data in outcomes out. So yeah. how, I'm trying to think of the question I'm trying to ask, you know, is, is this iterative? Like, could you continually be thinking about what variables might be um, newly present that could then be added to your algorithm or, you know, do you have to do the work all over again? Does that make oh, sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And um, it's an algorithm that we developed. So if we would like to add some features or remove some features, we can definitely do that because we already developed the algorithm. And if we if we can just add the features and see whether it's relevant or it makes any difference, that if it makes a huge difference, we can definitely add it to um, the in the web based, web based tool so that we can update um, um, the update the tool. So it was possible to do that. It's possible to do that, to add the features. Yeah. That was your question? Yes, it was. That? Thank you. Yeah, and yeah. I, think, I think we are um, out of time. Um, it's uh, a 129, and we have the next presenter here. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Park, for sharing your um, highly impressive work with us. Uh, thank you again, and looking forward to uh, the future, yeah, future output from this work. Thank you. So why don't we bring our next speaker to the front? I see Heather. And let me just um, go ahead and do something here so that she can come on into the panel. There she is. So I'd love to now introduce um, one of our very own PhD students, Heather Lynn Abraham, who's being um, advised by one of our uh, faculty, Dr. Melissa Pinto. And uh, she is going to present on COVID symptoms, symptom clusters, and predictors for becoming a long hauler, looking for clarity in the haze of the pandemic. Welcome, Heather, and really looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you, Dr. Bender. All right, let me share my screen here. Just want to make sure. Can everybody see my slides? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Bender. As she said, today I'm going to be presenting my res our research on COVID symptoms, symptom clusters, and predictors for becoming a long hauler. This research is being conducted by members of the COVID-19 Research Collaborative. It's a multidisciplinary team that's come together over the past year to study both the biologic basis for and the patient experience of long-haul COVID. 
This is a new disease and we essentially know nothing about it. I'm excited to present our foundational work today. We feel it's really important to translate our findings for the general public. And as a PhD student, it has been really exciting to see our science covered by the New York Times, US News and World Report Nightly Evening News, and on ABC and CNN Primetime, among others. Pictured are the members of the collaborative and our co-researchers that came together to work on this project. As you can see, experts from a variety of disciplines have come together to form the COVID-19 Research Collaborative. With such a multidisciplinary team, we are able to leverage diverse expertise to begin to understand the physiologic underpinnings of long-haul COVID, as well as its physical, psychosocial, and cognitive impacts from different angles and using different techniques. Because this is a symposium for UCI, I would especially like to acknowledge my dissertation chair, Dr. Melissa Pinto, and other mentors at UCI, Drs. Amir Rahmani, Jessica Borelli, and Nikhil Dutt, as well as CIS PhD students, Yang and Malad. In this research, our colleagues in computer science led analysis techniques to make sense of electronic health record data and help us understand how long COVID symptoms are correlated, how symptoms cluster, and to develop a predictive model of who may potentially become a long hauler based on early symptoms and demographics. Today, the US is breathing a sigh of relief as the COVID-19 pandemic seems to be coming to an end. With improved treatment, effective public health measures, and massive vaccination efforts, we expect that the pandemic will soon be relegated to the history books. Most kids are back in school, people are returning to work, concerts and sporting events are happening again, and heck, even Disneyland is open. Life is returning to normal. However, there's a large group of people who are not yet breathing a sigh of relief and whose lives are not yet returning to normal. These are the millions of people who are suffering with long-term effects of infection with SARS-CoV-2 virus. Disabling symptoms that are lingering well past the expected 10 to 14 day viral course, sometimes for over a year. These are the COVID long haulers. This is the shadow pandemic. Over 32 million Americans have survived infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's estimated that 10 to 30% of these survivors will go on to develop long haul COVID. That means conservatively, 3.2 million Americans will be long haulers. Struggling with debilitating, persistent and ever evolving symptoms that can last for months. This is what the NIH has termed post-acute sequela of SARS-CoV-2 infection or PASC. SARS-CoV-2 is a novel coronavirus and managing the acute sequela of the actual infection is what is most important for reducing mortality. That is why most research has been focused on the 1% of COVID patients that are sick enough to need to be hospitalized. And that makes sense because we've been worried about saving lives, not necessarily about preventing morbidity. However, we're at the point now where the pandemic is subsiding. And because of that, we're realizing we have a massive public health problem with PASC. It's becoming evident that just surviving this infection doesn't mean you won't have potentially lifelong consequences. Even if your initial effect infection was what we call the Tylenol, Tylenol and Gatorade variety, that mild to moderate disease that wasn't severe enough to require hospitalization. Our data, as well as that of others, has shown that infection with SARS-CoV-2 can cause PASC across all ethnic groups, all age groups, and all populations. Until now, data on PASC has largely come from hospitalized patients, but now it's clear that non-hospitalized patients are at significant risk, and the state of the science on those patients is practically nil, nothing. To begin to understand the underlying pathophysiology and assess the public health impact of PASC, we need research on the sequela of less severe COVID disease. It's not uncommon for viral infections to have lingering infect, effects, what's known as a post-viral syndrome. However, one characteristic that seems to differentiate PASC from other post-viral syndromes is the heterogeneity of the symptoms people are experiencing. Although the respiratory system seems to be the primary target of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, multiple other organ systems can be affected during infection. PASC patients present with a wide range of symptoms from persistent cough to hair loss, brain fog to unusual bruising. Some symptoms also seem to occur together, such as shortness of breath and chest pain, or loss of sense of taste and loss of sense of smell. The underlying pathophysiology of these symptoms and why they tend to group together is unknown. 
it's important to understand the association between past symptoms and how the symptoms interact with one another. We also need better understanding of the factors that predict if someone will become a long hauler because potential association between symptoms and symptom clusters and how they evolve across time is integral to the development of evidence-based PASC management guidelines. To further our understanding of PASC, we looked at the electronic health records of approximately 2,000 non-hospitalized patients with PCR-confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, what I'll refer to as a positive COVID test. We examined these records first to describe medically documented symptoms, and second, to identify factors that increase risk to become a long hauler. To do this, we evaluated symptoms at presentation, which we defined as days zero to 30 following the positive COVID test, and then at 180 or more days after the positive test. We also looked at demographic variables to see if they had an impact on the risk to become a long hauler. There's not yet a standard case definition for PASC, so for this study, we defined PASC as persistent symptoms for 180 days or more after the positive COVID test. We chose 180 or more days because this would place an individual six months post-infection. Normally, you would expect that if you had some other type of virus, like the common cold or the flu, it would be completely resolved by six months. You wouldn't be coming back to your provider to seek care related to your cold or flu from six months ago. So in this theoretic window, we would expect that any symptoms or late sequela would have resolved. The 180 or more day window provides us with a clearer picture of PASC. To ensure that confidence, our confidence that the symptoms developed in the electronic health, I'm sorry, to ensure our confidence that the symptoms documented in the electronic health record are related to SARS-CoV-2 infection and its sequela, individuals had to have at least a two-year history in the UC health system, well before COVID even existed. We then excluded any symptoms that were reported in the year prior to the positive COVID test to ensure that any symptoms were not carryovers from other conditions. Because essentially nothing is known about PASC, we were interested in understanding what are the symptoms of PASC and how do they evolve over time? Which symptoms tend to occur together and are they closely related? What factors increase one's risk for developing PASC? To answer these questions, we use the University of California COVID Research Data Set or UC Quartz to access the electronic health records of over 52,000 patients in the UC health system who tested, who tested for COVID. The data set includes patients who tested both positive and negative. By using the EHR, we were able to accurately reconstruct the timeline of symptoms without having to recall, rely on patient recall of what symptoms they had, their onset and their duration. To be included in the data analysis, the individual had to have a positive COVID test, had never been hospitalized for COVID-19, and have at least a two-year history in the UC health system. Again, the two-year history requirement would allow us to have confidence that any symptoms reported could be attributed to COVID infection and its sequela, not a chronic disease or other pre-existing condition. The individuals also needed to have at least one encounter after their positive COVID test. Exclusion criteria included having a false positive or a false negative test, and a false positive or false negative is when you tested both positive and negative within the same day, and reinfection with SARS-CoV-2. We selected these 40 symptoms based on one of the first Italian studies that looked at the long-term sequela of people hospitalized with COVID-19. These were the 40 persistent symptoms they identified. So this was the starting point for us to begin to investigate this problem and be able to compare our findings. Since this work, we've learned from our other work with over 5,000 past patients. And unfortunately, I won't have time to go into that work today, but we learned that there are over 100 unique PASC symptoms. So in short, this research is our first brush beginning to look at symptoms, but it should definitely not be considered all-inclusive of ever, every PASC symptom recorded. One of the advantages of working with such a multidisciplinary team as we have in the COVID-19 Research Collaborative is that we can leverage the expertise of colleagues from different specialties to help us understand what is happening with PASC. In this study, our colleagues in computer science helped us to make sense of the data we'd gathered. I'm a nurse. I am not a computer scientist. 
I don't pretend to understand the intricacies of this data analysis technique, but I do have a good enough grasp of the techniques to give you Nurse Heather's non-computer science description of our analysis when I discuss the findings. To identify symptoms of PASC and how they evolve over time, we identified prevalence of symptoms at presentation and at 180 or more days after a positive COVID test. To identify which symptoms tend to occur together and are closely related, we used non-negative matrix, matrix factorization or NMF to identify symptom clusters at both time points and graphical lasso or GLASSO to identify how tightly correlated two symptoms are. Finally, to begin to understand and identify the risk factors of developing PASC, we created a predictive model to identify the potential key factors, including demographics, symptoms at days 0 to 11, and being asymptomatic at days 0 to 11 that may help predict if a subject with a positive COVID test will go on to become a long hauler. These tables show the demographics of our full sample and the demographics of those that went on to become long haulers with lingering symptoms beyond 180 days. As you can see in our sample, the demographics of those that went on to become long haulers very closely matches that of the full sample. To identify the symptoms of PASC and how they evolve over time, we identified the most prevalent symptoms at presentation, which included cough, fever, chest pain, shortness of breath, and headache. And the most prevalent symptoms among long haulers, which included shortness of breath, chest pain, abdominal pain, headache, and low back pain. To identify which symptoms tend to cluster together and which are closely related, we used NMF, which identified five symptom clusters at presentation. We described each cluster by the two most dominant symptoms in the cluster. For example, the shortness of breath and diarrhea cluster or the cough and diarrhea cluster. The dominant score reflects which of the symptoms got the most attention in the electronic health record, not how problematic the symptom was to the patient. So for example, in the shortness of breath and diarrhea cluster, of the five symptoms reported, shortness of breath was referred to in the electronic health record the most. Then to determine which symptoms were closely associated with, with each other, GLASSO was used to create a system network model. In this model, the darker and the thicker the line, the stronger the correlation. For example, at presentation, V6 and V7, which are, I'm sorry, V6 and V13, which are um, dysgeusia and anosmia, which is loss of sense of taste and loss of sense of smell, are very closely related. We have that nice, thick, very dark line uh, connecting the two. Whereas V8 and V9, which are shortness of breath and chest pain, were very le much less strongly correlated. The same analysis was done for long haulers. NMF analysis identified five different symptom clusters. And GLASSO analysis demonstrated the strongest correlation between symptoms for long haulers is between loss of sense of taste and tinnitus or ringing in the ears. To identify risk factors leading to developing PASC, we created a predictive model that inputs multiple potential key characteristics that would either increase or decrease the potential likelihood to become a long hauler. So the nurse Heather explanation for the, how this computer modeling works is that we told the computer, computer, this is what long haul looks like. So it's what the demographics and the symptoms of our 277 long haulers at 180 days or more were. So we, we gave him that and said, this is long haulers. Then we gave the computer our 1,876 folks that didn't go on to be long haulers and said, this is what a long hauler is not. Now tell us what the difference between the two is and how big those differences are. And the computer generates a model and tells us what features at presentation are or are not important in predicting if someone will progress to be a long hauler. At the top of the diagram are the features most important to, become, to increase the potential likelihood of an individual to develop PASC. And as you go down the chart and to the left, the features become less important. As you can see, a very important feature in someone developing 
um, PASC is having no symptoms when they initially test positive for COVID. Other features include alopecia, which is hair loss, age greater than 80, chronic runny nose, and joint pain. We also evaluated, evaluated which factors in the first 10 days would most likely result in grouping within one of the five symptom clusters identified among long haulers. In this image, the darker the color, the more likely the presenting feature is to be associated with the indicated symptom cluster. The greatest magnitude between an early symptom and membership in a long haul cluster is those who presented with fatigue were more likely to be in the dyspnea and cough cluster. And those who presented with headache were more likely to be in the chest pain cough cluster. If you were initially asymptomatic, but having past symptoms at 180 or more days, so here's no symptoms, very dark here, you're very likely to be in the um, heart palpitation and anxiety cluster, much more so than these lighter colors over here in the dyspnea and cough cluster. Understanding these patterns may have some implications for understanding the underlying mechanisms for these specific symptom clusters. Our findings provide much needed insight into features of PASC and early factors that can increase the likelihood of some individuals to progress to long haul COVID. We believe there are three key points from our analysis. First, based on our def demographic information, PASC seems to be relatively normally distributed across the population. Therefore, clinically, we would expect to see people of all ages, all ethnicities, and both genders to be reflected in PASC. It's unclear at this point in time if gender or ethnicity or age are in fact strong predictors of developing PASC. We need to validate the model in a much larger sample to determine if PASC affects one demographic group more frequently than another. Second, those who reported no symptoms when they tested positive for COVID account for a significant portion of long haulers. In our sample, 32% of those with persistent symptoms at 180 or more days were asymptomatic when they tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 infection. Third, the symptom experience of those who become long haulers changes over time. Both the symptom prevalence and the system clusters observed among long haulers vary compared with those at initial presentation. The evolution of symptom prevalence and symptom clusters may provide insight into the etiology of PASC. Use of UC cords allowed us to capture both patient reported and clinician documented symptoms. These were recorded in real time. This minimizes retrospective recall, which has been used in most studies to date. Now, I don't know about you, but I can barely remember what I had for breakfast. So if you ask me to remember what symptom I had three months ago and how long it lasts, I'm probably not gonna give you very accurate uh, results. UC cords includes symptoms uncovered by providers. So the patient may come into the appointment feeling like they're, the symptom they have is not related to the primary problem that prompted the visit. So they won't report the symptom to the provider, but during the visit, the provider may uncover that symptom and document it in the electronic health record. We were able to exclude any symptoms reported in the one year prior to SARS-CoV-2 infection, which increased our confidence that symptoms were attributable to becoming a long hauler. It also allowed for a large variety of symptoms to be included rather than a narrowly focused checkli checklist of symptoms, which provides a better understanding of the symptoms among long haulers. However, it's likely that not all symptoms are captured. As I pointed out earlier, patients are likely to focus on symptoms that are most bothersome and that they think are associated with the primary problem. If a patient is seeing uh, the doctor for ringing in the ears, for example, they may not think to mention the rash on their ankle, especially if they don't think it's related. Limitations of our study include our relatively small sample size in one healthcare system in one geographical area of the US. We need more data from more diverse sample to validate our predictive model. The way the data is recorded in the electronic health record did present some limitations as well. It wasn't feasible to capture an accurate patient BMI. Including BMI in our data analysis would provide further insight into potential predictive factors for becoming a long hauler. Also, in the electronic health record, ethnicity is limited to broad groupings such as Asian or Hispanic. These broad, broad groupings lack the needed specificity. Long haul is a new disease. There is no cure. 
Long haul causes severe functional impairment, often in otherwise healthy people. We're just beginning to realize what an enormous public health impact this disease is going to have. Healthcare providers, employers, and society need to recognize this as a serious long-term illness and assist people in recovery. Providers need to recognize this condition as a novel virus and not the same as myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, or chronic Lyme disease. They can learn from patients by listening and not dismissing. We hope that this research will prompt longitudinal perspective studies that collect patient-generated reports of symptoms rather than patient responses to questionnaires created by researchers. Allowing the patient to fully describe their symptom experience will enrich our understanding of this disease. And since this, this is such a new phenomenon, an ethnographic approach that focuses on understanding patients' experiences would add an important lens to our analysis. Thank you very much. I'm happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Heather, for that fantastic presentation. Um, I've just really learned a lot just from, um, from your talk. And um, I do wanna just comment that after having taught statistics for which you were in my class, I think you're being very modest about kind of Nurse Heather explanation. <laughs> I have no doubt about your capability to fully uh, master a lot of these uh, computational techniques. So uh, definitely kudos to you and to, to the uh, rest of the team for just an amazing work and very timely and important as well. Um, so I think you, you did kind of touch on this. But my, so my first question, um, so before I, I actually pose my question, I do want to remind the audience uh, to please go ahead and place your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom right. Um, so my first question is, and, and you know, like I said, you did touch on it at the end, but I wonder um, if you know, sort of what your thoughts are about possibility of kind of missed detection of uh, some of the symptoms from um, relying on the EHR. So for example, you know, if I have some symptoms, but um, uh, I don't feel like going in to, to be seen or, or my access to healthcare is such that um, I'm not able to as easily be seen. So, you know, um, some of those kind of considerations and um, if it's possible that some of these uh, symptoms may have been missed and what impact um, that may have, and if there are kind of any thoughts about how to validate um, the, the symptoms that are being detected using uh, EHR. Thank you for that question. So yes, there probably are quite a few symptoms that are being missed. Um, this area of research is so new and we are basically starting from scratch. We, we really don't, this is probably one of the first times in medicine that we have, we are starting with something completely new and unusual, and we really don't have much um, research to start with. Um, so we're, we, we need to start somewhere, and this is where we started based on the research that we have seen other, um, other uh, researchers have done. We, Pick those 40 symptoms based on prior research um, with the understanding that there probably are other symptoms that um, weren't, that were being reported that weren't being captured in the electronic health record, uh, but we needed to start someplace. As far as patients that aren't being seen, um, it, it, it kind of goes back to the limitations that we have being in the UC health system. This is a very limited group, a, a small geographically, um, a limited group and in only one health system and only people that are actually being seen in the outpatient setting. So it does limit our findings. And what we need to do is we need to um, do more research. We need to get um, surveys and um, um, uh, we need to connect with people that have not been in contact with the health system. So we need to you know, do maybe internet-based research and send surveys out to folks. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's, it's tough because we're, because we're just starting to do research in this area, we're just kind of dipping our toe in the water. So this was one thing we had access to right now. So let's take a look at this, but there's so much work that still needs to be done to get a full picture of what the true symptom, pic the, the true symptom experience is like for our patients and everything that can fall under the umbrella of PASC. Yeah. Thank you for that. That was very helpful. And 
Um, and I have no doubt, given the amazing team that, that you're part of, that, that you'll make just uh, breakthroughs and inroads into this important question. So um, Miriam just reminded me that we're actually out of time uh, for questions. So thank you again. And I know we're all kind of on Zoom, but I do want to just physically applaud you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, great job. Thank you.